Well, good morning, everyone. We are going to get started here with our worship service. So if you would all kindly find your places and stand with me, we are going to uh, begin this morning with our reading of the Word. We are going to be reading this morning from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. And this is the word of the Lord. Verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that amazing? Let's all sing together and worship our Lord and Savior. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. His mercy is more. What love could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their songs. Thrown into a sea without sure our sins they are many but his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy is more stronger than darkness His mercy is more And what patience would wait As we constantly roam What Father so tender Is calling us home He welcomes the weakest
sins they are many but his mercy is
Isn't that great? It's so good to be here. You know, you come and we worship and we, we listen and read those words, and all of a sudden we're brought to a, another place, isn't it? It's just, you know, we got the Holy Spirit living within us. The Bible says that when we gather together, two or three, He is with us, and it says that God inhabits the praise of His people. I just kind of, it's like, boom, ba-boom. But boom, you know, more and more and more, and we're together. Thank you for being here, because, because you're here, we can praise that praise together. We can praise together and love the Lord with all of our hearts in worship and praise. And so uh, if you weren't here, you'd be missing it, but we'd be missing you, too. We'd be missing you, too. Thank you for being here today. If you're new, we're really glad you're here, and why don't you just say hello to somebody uh, next to you, and then we'll continue in a second. You're not new, I'm not oh, going to shake your hand. What? If you're, if you're not new, I'm going to shake your hand. Oh, okay. I only look for new. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, the school? Is this the... Is this the... Let's go back. This one's cool, but we start next week. Next week, okay. So the other school is kind of pretty much similar. Yeah, because they all the same. Today, Chris is upstairs teaching. Oh, okay. Cool. Oh, yeah. All right. It's a beautiful sight to see you guys all fellowshipping. We've been demoted. Well, good morning once again. I wanted to just uh, come up and give a quick update. I know that many of us have been praying for Chris Mueller from Faith Bible Church. Uh, Faith Bible is another church in town that is a, a kind of a sister church of ours that we are so thankful to have a, a solid church that teaches God's word. Um, and so, but Chris Mueller had a heart attack this past week, and he is in the hospital. And he is, uh, as of yesterday evening, he was still intubated and on a ventilator. And so, uh, we're praying for him to make a full recovery. The good news is that he is, even though he's uh, intubated, he is waking up and he's giving thumbs up and kind of nods here and there to to people. So he has. Um, he's conscious, and but we, we want to pray that the Lord would help him recover and make a full recovery. So let's take a moment to pray for Chris. Lord, uh, we are just uh, thankful for Chris and that he is uh, uh, somebody who loves you and has hope in you and teaches your word. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, just allow his body to heal and experience great healing. Um, even today, Lord, pray that he would be able to get off of the ventilator very quickly and Lord, that you would allow him to um, just be able to breathe on his own and pray that you'd give the doctors and his team great wisdom as they help him, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that he was able to get to the hospital and get the treatment that he needed quickly. And uh, thank you, Lord, that we live in a time and a place where that was possible for him. And Father, I pray that you would provide healing for him, that you provide comfort for him, peace for him. Pray you would give peace to his family. And pray for Faith Bible Church this morning as they meet, um, that you would just bless that church, watch over them, and, and care for them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. If I say MJ, how many, what do you guys think about? Michael Jordan. Well, you're going to change your new little paradigm because we've got a brand new MJ in the house back there. Natalie and Kyle, Kyle Natalie. have Millie Jo. Go. Millie Jo back there. She's taking a little nap or sleeping. whatever. So uh, MJ, there's our new MJ right there, okay? Don't think of Michael Jordan. You're going to think of baby MJ now, okay? All right. So what a, what a blessing. Congratulations, you guys. Thanks for coming today and being here with us. So um, We got our men's breakfast this next Saturday. 
Um, if you want to be Ooh, there, all right. Yay. And there, Brian's the one guy clapping. Come on now. Come on now. Yeah, yeah. Um, starting, in, and I think we mentioned this last week, identity, th- identity theft, forgetting our identity in Jesus Christ. Forgetting our identity in Jesus Christ. Identity theft. This should be a great uh, study they're going through. Uncovering the riches of our spiritual identity and learn how, to sh- learn how it shapes both our inner character and our outward conduct. If you guys want to be there early, we need, need some help with uh, guys setting up for cooking and setup. And if you have any questions and, and you can help, contact Richard, uh, Brian Campbell or Eric Richardson and sign up today. Is it scan or it's scan? Okay. It's, it's, or, yeah. Okay. Got it. All right. Thank you, Brian. All righty. I like the last sentence there. It says, uh, your early sign up is a key ingredient for our breakfast. <laughs> See what they did there. I like nice, it. Nice. <laughs> um, Sunday, August 25th, for those who are new, newer, or maybe you guys have been here for about six months or so, maybe even a year, but you want to know more about us and the church and who we are, we have an Explore the Hills after our church on Sunday the 25th. Yes, after service. Uh, there will be food. We invite you guys to come. We'll have some of the elders there, maybe some deacons and some other uh, faithful uh, churchgoers there that you guys can just talk to and learn and, and get connected. So we'd really like to see you there if you're new. Next, we have our scripture journals. Um, we will have these available uh, on August 18th. They're $5 per cost. If you guys remember, I think we did the same thing for our Roman yeah, studies. Was awesome. It was great. Yeah. Um, it'll have scripture on one side, then I'll have a journal on the next side so you guys can mark up the word, put in your notes, sermon notes, whatever. It's a great journal to have. I know I've recently gone back through my Romans one to look at it, so it's just a good, um, a good thing to have. And those will be available starting next week for Luke. Good deal. This time we have, just want to make your, uh, take your attention to our contact cards in our bulletin. If you're new or you have any needs that we can be a part of, or if you, we can connect with you in a, in a special way, please go ahead and look at the contact card, fill those out, drop those in the offering uh, bucket as it played as it comes by. And uh, if you're new, we don't want your money. We're just glad you're here with us today uh, to be a part of our church family. So if the ushers can come on forward, we'll, we'll take our offering. And um, if you have any special prayer needs, it's always good to know. Like we saw that, that, that need request from, um, for uh, Chris Mueller came out during the week when we're working. And I always say this. We come out during the week and we're working. There's needs and we're reminded of, of the body and how we have the privilege of being able to be there for each other in prayer. So let's pray. Thanks, Lord, for the reminder of our need for you. Um, our sins, they are many. Your mercy is more. And we are brought to a place of, of uh, real s- sober joy when we remember our sin and your gracious gift of of forgiveness and hope that we have we uh, thank you for the time to be together to worship and um, enjoy one another and to bring our hearts and minds to you thank you for this offering and thank you so much for the privilege we have of giving and for the way you bless us and for the way you uh you encourage us even through the the rough waters and today is one of those days where you give us that joy and encouragement to reconnect in a special way. So we thank you for the ministry of our church, the faithfulness of the teaching of the word, the wonderful worship, and the so many people that are serving and committed to serving in their neighborhoods, in their schools, in the, in wherever they are, to, to spread the name and the love of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
you all stand with us as we continue to sing? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. In wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned, unclean. Singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows he made them his very own he bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone singing how marvelous how wonderful and my song Scorned by the ones he came to 
to say till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory No guilt in life, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my death. Let's all continue to stand together as we read the word. Good morning, church. We'll be reading out of uh, Luke chapter 1 this morning. there first. <laughs> Dang it. All right, beginning in verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by a lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. And fear fell upon, upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have a joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, drink and will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this time that we get to have in your word this morning. And I ask that you would be with us as we listen, as we take it in, Lord, as hearers and receivers of this message. Lord, that you would open up our hearts and our minds, that you would help steady our focus and keep us on this subject for today. 
Lord, help it to rattle around in us all week this week, that we would call back on this message when we need it, and Lord, that we would see it applied in our day-to-day life, in our families, in our household, at work, wherever it might be needed. I ask that you'd be with the preacher this morning as well, that you would give him encouragement, that you would speak through him, Lord, that you would use that, uh, and that, Lord, ultimately, your word would be delivered and not his. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning. morning. Well, most of us know what it's like to experience gut-wrenching disappointment, pain, disappointment, and loss. Such was the experience of C.S. Lewis. Lewis was single for the vast majority of his life, and he had learned to be content in his singleness. He lived with his brother, and he had a flourishing friend group nicknamed the Inklings, and uh, he was happy in his writing, his academic pursuits, and marriage was nowhere on his horizon. But that changed when Lewis developed a friendship with a woman named Joy Davidman. And at first, Lewis and Davidman were friends through correspondence, but then that friendship blossomed into a deep and abiding love. They were married on August 23rd, 1956, when Lewis was 57 years old. But shortly after their marriage, Davidman's health began to deteriorate, and later that same year, she was diagnosed with cancer. Still, Lewis described those years as the happiest of his life. He said this, he said, We feasted on love, every mode of it, solemn and merry, romantic and realistic, sometimes as dramatic as a thunderstorm, sometimes as comfortable as putting on your soft slippers. And just over four years later, on July 13th, 1960, Joy passed into the presence of Jesus, leaving Lewis in a state of loss, disappointment, and grief. And at this time, he wrote the book, A Grief Observed, as a way of processing his grief. And he was brutally honest about what he was feeling in that book. And here are some of the things he said there. Her absence is like the sky spread over everything. I don't know how to explain this. I find it hard to believe that God can still be good and yet allow this to happen. What I feel is I have lost all sense of direction. There is no longer any real map or guide. I'm wandering in a wasteland, and every path seems to lead to nowhere. Maybe you've experienced loss and disappointment. Maybe the death of a loved one, the loss of health, the loss of a dream or hope. Maybe you've been laid off from a job that you worked hard to achieve. Or maybe you're in a stage of life that is just not turning out to be what you are hoping for, and you're walking in a period of disappointment, grief, and loss. How should we respond when we experience disappointment? How should we respond when life is painful and hard and difficult? What is it that we should bank on in those times? Well, today we're continuing to launch our study through the Gospel of Luke, And Luke begins at a period of time where Israel was experiencing disappointment, frustration, and even grief over their circumstances. As a nation, they were restored to the land that God had promised them. But it has been 400 years since a prophet spoke. 400 years. That's older than our entire country's existence. That's 20 generations of people. In that time, the rule of Israel had passed through several hands. It began with Israel being under the thumb of the Persian Empire. But then Alexander the Great conquered much of the world, and the Greeks began to rule. After his death, his empire was divided among his four generals, and at first, Israel was ruled by the Egyptian part of the Greek Empire. But then it was ruled by the Syrian part of the Greek Empire. And then there was a a, a small period where Israel gained independence. But that independence became corrupt and immoral and was a perpetual time of struggle and intrigue. And eventually, in 63 BC, Rome 
took over the rule of Israel. And they appointed the wicked King Herod as the king of the Jews. That was his official title. So now it's been 400 years. Israel has had no new prophet for 20 generations. And it seems as if God has forgotten them. It's a time of disappointment, a time that seems like spiritual barrenness. In Luke 1, it describes the birth of Jesus at the end of Luke 1 with this haunting metaphor. Luke 1, it says, The sunrise shall visit us from on high. See, the night before that sunrise had been long and dark. But for the faithful, bright flashes of hope from God's word assured them that the night would come to an end. Malachi had assured those who loved God that the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go forth out leaping like calves from the stall. Isaiah had promised that before the glory of the Lord would be revealed, there would come a voice, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the desert, in the desert, a highway for our God. Malachi spoke similarly when he penned the final words of the Old Testament. He said, behold, <clears throat> excuse me, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And when Luke wrote his gospel, more than 400 years had passed since Malachi penned those words without a single prophet or sign from God. <clears throat> but in that long, but then that long period of darkness was about to experience a sunrise. Great plans laid in eternal ages past began to activate. Angels scurried around busily preparing the way for the dawn. And this chapter begins with the first glimmer of that dawn, when hope is beginning to rise. And it doesn't even begin with the birth of Jesus. Rather, the first glimmer that something new is going to happen begins with the promised forerunner to the Messiah, Jesus, a prophet named John, who would baptize people in repentance for their sins. That's the story that we're looking at today. And this narrative forms a bridge between the Old Testament age of promise and the New Testament age of fulfillment when the sun would rise. So as we study this story, we're going to see how we should respond to disappointment. We'll unpack this passage in four steps that show us how God's promises break through our disappointment and loss. And so we're going to see four points this morning. So if you're not there, open to Luke 1. And our story begins with a story of disappointment and grief. The story of a godly priest named Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth. Let's read about them beginning in verse 5. It says this, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. All right, this sets the stage for the rest of the story. And there's a lot of things wrong here. First, it's wrong that Herod is ruling over Judea. Herod was a shrewd politician a powerful orator, an innovative builder, and an evil, wicked man. He married 10 women and had 15 children by them. He was so protective over his favorite wife, Miriam I, that he ordered his soldiers to kill her if anything happened to him while he was traveling abroad. And he had two of his sons strangled to death after there were rumors of mutiny. And as we all know, he murdered all the boys two years old and younger around Bethlehem at the time of the birth of Jesus. And that was towards the end of his life. He also ordered that upon his death, his son Antipater would be executed, and all the Jewish elders who were imprisoned would be executed. His thought was he wanted the Jews to be mourning when he died. So this was the guy who was the king of Israel. But secondly, 
The second wrong thing in this passage is we have an older couple who are godly and have been unable to have a child. You see it there in verse 6? It says, And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. This doesn't mean they were without sin. No, the law provided for ways for people to be forgiven of their sins. But this was a couple that honored God throughout their life. They see God's word as their authority. They follow God's ways over their own ways. Their home surely enjoyed the happiness that comes to a household where both the husband and the wife are living under God's rule, except there was one big discouragement. They were unable to have children. As verse 7 puts it, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both advanced in years. We can well imagine the lifetime of heartache behind those words. This was the great disappointment of Elizabeth's life. She'd always wanted to hold a child in her arms, but now that was impossible. She'd gone through menopause. Her womb was now old and barren. And any woman who's ever wanted a child knows what Elizabeth must have endured. The prying questions, the insensitive remarks, the sharp pang of desire for someone else's baby, and the nagging doubts about the goodness of God. But for Elizabeth, there's something even worse. The suggestion that this was somehow her fault. Because see, in any culture, infertility is an aching disappointment. But to add insult to injury, in Hebrew culture, barrenness was considered a disgrace, even a punishment. This was bad manners, but even worse theology. Elizabeth was not ungodly. It says she was righteous before God. And so whatever heartache she suffered was not punishment for her sin. You know, our sins are not always the cause of our suffering. Sometimes they are. Um, Many sins have destructive consequences that make us rue the day we ever decided to disobey God. This is one of the ways God trains us to pursue righteousness. But many of the things we suffer have nothing to do with our own sin. Sometimes we suffer uh, for exactly the opposite reason, because we are walking righteously. Sometimes we suffer from the sin of others. And sometimes God allows us to suffer because he wants to be glorified through our suffering. But most of the time, we have no idea what God's reasons are. And so we should be very careful in reaching the wrong conclusions about why something bad is happening to us or to someone else. But in this case, Elizabeth was barren, for the glory of God. God was not punishing her, but planning a miracle where he would prepare his people for salvation and bring Elizabeth great joy. So Elizabeth was suffering because of the way God wanted to be glorified through her life. So part of the Christian perspective on suffering is that even when we suffer, even when we experience disappointment and loss, there is a way for us to honor and glorify God through that. And that leads to our first point this morning. Though we may be experiencing disappointment, God is at work to fulfill his promises. God is at work to fulfill his promises. See, although they had experienced disappointment, all the while God was at work. God was bringing about his promises. It may have felt like he wasn't hearing their prayers, their pleas, but all the while he was there. He had a plan and he was working it out. And that means the question to ask when we face disappointment and suffering is not, what have I done to deserve this? It's not, why is this happening to me? It's, how can I glorify God through this? And Elizabeth is the perfect example of this. She didn't wait to have a child before her life could begin. She was busy serving the Lord, walking blamelessly in the commandments of God. For her, what some people considered a tragedy was an opportunity. No matter what we are suffering, no matter what we must endure, there is a way for us to live for the glory of God. And God is always at work, even amidst our disappointments. You see, the main character of this story is not Zechariah, and not Elizabeth, and not John the Baptist. It's God himself. 
God is the main character. He is the central actor. He is dominant. He is all pervasive. And as the story progresses, we're going to see this. God is real. He's active. He's unstoppable. God sent his angel. God struck Zechariah dumb. God made barren Elizabeth conceive. God sent John the Baptist. God was preparing the way for Jesus. God was fulfilling his promises. God is at work. And with God, nothing is impossible, as 137 tells us. See, the barrenness of Elizabeth is more than one woman's story. This is also a picture of Israel. The barrenness of this righteous couple is not simply their private misfortune. It also symbolizes Israel that's under a curse worse than Herod's tyranny and Rome's overlordship. Israel is in need of deliverance and rescue. And Elizabeth and Zechariah represent God's people, seemingly without hope of a future. Elizabeth's disgrace is symptomatic of Israel's disgrace, of spiritual barrenness. And this means that this story is also about you and about me. This story provokes us to ask, will we serve God faithfully through our disappointments? Will God mean more to us than all the unfulfilled plans and dreams? Will our disappointments make us bitter or make us better? Do we trust that God is at work even amidst the heartache? God is at work. He will fulfill his promises. And any ancient Israelite who knew how God had worked in the past should have been primed to see this. At the founding of the nation of Israel, God caused barren Sarah to have the promised child. Later, God allowed barren Rachel to have a child, have children. God allowed barren Hannah to conceive one of Israel's greatest prophets, Samuel. And so we should be primed to expect God to step in and bring the pain of barrenness to an end. And that's exactly what he does. Let's look at how God keeps his promise. And as we do so, we're going to see this. God's promises are both cosmic and personal in scope. And they all point to Jesus. Read with me in verse 8. It says this in verse 8. Now, while he was serving as a priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. So Zechariah didn't live in Jerusalem. Instead, he would travel to Jerusalem to serve at the temple for two one-week periods each year. Um, he was one of about 18,000 priests in Israel at the time. And so the rest of the time, he was a spiritual leader in his community. Imagine a godly rural pastor. And while he was serving as a priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple and burn incense. And this was literally a once-in-a-lifetime event for Zechariah. Priests were chosen by lot to, for the honor of burning incense in the temple, and they would do this in the court just outside the Holy of Holies. But the altar of incense was just on the, 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 the wall that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple area. So this was as close to God's holy presence as Zechariah would ever come. And once a priest had been given this honor by lot, they would never put their name in the lot again. So this was a big deal. This was his once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And you can imagine Zechariah thinking, wow, I can't wait to tell Elizabeth that the Lord allowed me to be the one to go burn incense before his presence. The burning of incense, it pictured the prayers of God's people rising up to him. And the temple would have been absolutely magnificent and beautiful. Gold-plated all around, warm light reflecting off the candle stands, the smell of incense. And so Zechariah goes about his task with great seriousness, with joy, and with reverence. 
And while he's doing so, people are outside praying, asking God to save Israel, no doubt. And he offers the incense, and his heart is soaring upward with the curling of the fragrance. But suddenly, it spasms in divine arrest because there appeared to him an angel of the Lord. In the Bible, angels are majestic, fearsome, powerful beings. My mom always calls my kids my little angels, and I always remind her, angels in the Bible are not cute little babies. They are <laughs> fearsome. They've got eyes everywhere. They're, you don't, don't want to mess with angels. So um, they reflect the holiness of God. They're often sent to judge. They evoke fear. And when John sees an angel in Revelation, he instinctively falls down and starts to worship the angel before the angel stops him. And so the first thing this angel says is, do not be afraid. And what's amazing is that in one fell swoop, the angel tells Zechariah that both his personal prayers and the prayers of all of Israel are about to be answered. Look at verse 13 again. It says, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers, your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You shall call his name John and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great before the Lord and he must not drink strong wine or strong drink, drink wine or strong drink for he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn the, many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. What a wonderful message this is. Through this angel, God says seven things. First, do not be afraid. Second, your prayer has been heard. Which prayer? His prayer for a son. He says, your wife Elizabeth will bear a son and you'll call his name John. And given Zechariah's response in verse 18, I don't think Zechariah was praying at that moment for a son. I think the angel... Um, delivered an answer to prayers prayed long ago and now almost forgotten and abandoned. Maybe Zechariah had thought God had not heard him or had forgotten him. He didn't realize that God records our prayers. And in the fullness of time, God sent an angel to say, I heard you. I have you in mind. God had stored those prayers until this dramatic moment in the plan of salvation. The third thing the angel says is you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Fourth, he will be great before the Lord. God will have special regard for this child. He will be a mighty man of God. Fifth, he must not drink wine or strong drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. One scholar put it this way. He said, such a total invasion by the Spirit of God is unprecedented. No one else is said to be so filled by God's Spirit. And so he must not drink alcohol. Nothing else should control him except for God's Spirit. Note, not drinking alcohol is reminiscent of Samson, who was set apart for God's work in the Old Testament. And why was John anointed with the Spirit of God? Because of the sixth thing it says in verse 16, he will turn and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. God will use Zechariah's son to ignite a spiritual revival in Israel. You know, we often underestimate the role of John the Baptist. John was greater than any prophet before him, greater than Samuel, greater than Elijah, greater than Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And how do we know that? Because Jesus told us, he said, I tell you, um, among those born of women, none is greater than John. And why was he so great? Because of the seventh thing the angel says in verse 16. He will turn the many of the children to the, of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to the children 
and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. John was the one who would usher in the Messiah. He was the one that Malachi was talking about when Malachi predicted Jesus in the final verses of the Old Testament. In Malachi 4, 5, and 6, the last two verses, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. You know, when a famous person is about to be recognized or receiving a reward, they have someone else, usually another famous person, come up and introduce them. That's what John did for Jesus. He's the one who rolled out the red carpet. He's the announcer who set the stage for the Messiah. He tilled the soil of people's hearts to bring about great repentance and revival that prepared people's hearts to receive the gospel of Jesus. Part of the reason that the early church grew and thrived in Israel is because God had used John to prepare the way. And Zechariah can hardly believe what he's hearing. This angel is saying to him that his personal prayers and the prayers of all Israel, indeed the prayers of righteous people in Israel for the past 400 years were about to be answered. Listen, if you have been praying for something, wrestling with God in prayer, and you don't see God answering, Maybe God is doing something bigger. Maybe God's plan is bigger and better than you can imagine. Maybe God's going to use your pain and suffering to point someone to Jesus, just as John pointed the way to Jesus. Maybe God's going to use your disappointment to till the soil of someone else's heart. God has purposes that are bigger than you can possibly imagine, and he loves to interweave his purposes for your life and his purposes for this world and this universe in a way that might be hard to see now, but in a way that works everything together for his glory. So trust him along the way. He is at work, both in your life, in our church, and in this universe. So though we may be experiencing disappointment, God is at work to fulfill his purposes, and God's promises are both cosmic and personal in scope. They all point to Jesus And this raises a question. How will we respond to God's promises? And what we'll see next is God calls us to have living faith in him. But our unbelief will not stop him from fulfilling his promises. Let's look at Zechariah's response to this angel in verse 18. It says, And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man. And my wife is advanced in years. Okay, side note here. But Zechariah is a wise, well-learned husband when he talks about his wife's age. He says, I am an old man and my wife is an old... I mean, my wife is advanced (laughs) in years. And then it says in verse 19, And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. What we see from Zechariah is how not to respond to God. (laughs) If you ever talk to an angel... This is like the not way to do it. Don't do it this way. He responds with unbelief. And what I think is really interesting is to consider this when we remember the the purpose of Luke's gospel. Remember what we saw last week? Luke 1.4 tells us the reason he wrote this gospel. It says in verse 4, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. What Luke is saying is I'm writing this so that you may have a living faith that you may know the locked down, secure, unshakable, solid, stable, immovable reality of the things you have been taught. I write my gospel, Luke says, so that you may know the safety, the bolted down security of what you've been taught. 
That's what that word means, certainty. These truths are safe from being stolen, safe from being changed, safe from ceasing to be what they are, safe from becoming unimportant or irrelevant, safe from not being reality anymore. These things will always be. This is the kind of knowing that caused the church to survive through three centuries of terrible and frequent persecutions. This is the kind of knowing that is immovable in the face of disease and abandonment and disillusionment and grief and martyrdom. And remember, Luke, as a doctor, has tended to Paul's body through countless beatings and imprisonments. He knows the kind of knowing that lasts and the kind that does not last. And at the outset of his gospel, he gives us an example of a righteous man who is living in unbelief. Zechariah is in God's temple, and the angel speaks to him and tells him that he's about to have a son who will usher in the Messiah, and Zechariah doubts the angel. And this tells us something about our faith. It tells us that it is possible and dangerous to insist on too much evidence before you believe. Ultimately, faith in Jesus is a posture of your heart towards God. And if you say, I'm not going to trust God, I'm not going to believe, I'm not going to step out in faith until every single question is answered and every possible doubt is quelled, then you're in a dangerous spot. And it's okay to want and ask for explanations when we're perplexed. Later in chapter 1, Mary finds out that she's pregnant, and she asks in Luke 1.34, how will this be since I am a virgin? But that wasn't unbelief. That was wonder. But here, Zechariah is living in unbelief. Gabriel says outright in verse 20, you did not believe my words. When Abraham was told that he would have a child with Sarah in his old age, listen to his response. It tells us in Romans 4.19, he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Zechariah responded with unbelief. He looked at his old age, his gray hair, his circumstances, and he doubted God. He was looking at life from the perspective of this world, not through the eyes of faith. Let me ask you, how are you living? It's possible to have an overall righteous life, but to not have a real living faith in God. It's possible to look right on the outside, but not trust that God is at work right now in your life, in your circumstances. Of course, he's doing big things. But in my life, he's kind of, nah, he's kind of forgotten. Of course, he's active on the world stage. But in my wife, life this week, he's not really doing anything of consequence. That is a wrong, frustrating, and sinful way to live. Don't you dare believe that God is not active in your life. He is still on the throne. He is at work. He knows every intimate detail. He is there in it all. And do you know, if you take a quarter, you can block out the noonday sun if you hold it right up to your eye? Sometimes we hold our problems and our limitations in our eyes that way, bringing them so close to our eyes that we can't see the great glowing sun of God's promises and power. When our eyes are on our problems, we will not remember God's word and how it applies to us. Why did Zechariah not remember Abraham in Genesis 17, 17? Abraham was in the same situation, wanting a child, and he and his wife were too old. And God gave Abraham and Sarah a son when they were nearly 100 years old. Zechariah should have remembered God's word, he sh but he was more focused on his limitations instead. When your eyes are on your disappointment, on your problems, you don't see clearly. In A Grief Observed, C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, 
You can't see anything properly while your eyes are blurred with tears. So Zechariah wants more proof than scriptures, more proof than an angel visiting him. He wants more proof than a promise. And in this way, this righteous man walks by sight and not by faith. And we can be righteous persons in the holiest places, carrying out the holiest acts of worship, and yet not believe God. Unbelief is sneaky that way. It slithers right into the midst of spiritual worship. You can be a preacher preaching the gospel and not believe anyone will be saved or changed. You can be married and not believe your spouse is a gift from God. We can pray for our heart's deepest desire and laced in the marrow of our prayer is sneaky unbelief. That was Zechariah. And that may be many of us in this room, not living with real faith in God. And as a result, he's disciplined by God. I love Gabriel's response, by the way. Gabriel answered him and says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. For Gabriel, who stands in God's holy, utterly majestic presence, the thought that God might not be true to his word, to one of his promises, was completely unthinkable. The thought was completely foreign to Gabriel. And so Zechariah is disciplined with muteness until the baby is born. You know, Martin Luther described the gospel as glad tidings, good news, welcome information, a shout, or something that makes one sing and talk and rejoice. And Zechariah knew the good news that Israel had been waiting for, only he couldn't tell anyone. Look at verse 21. It says, And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time for service had ended, ended, he went home. This afternoon, try this. Play charades and try to act out what Zechariah had seen. People had no idea why he's pointing around, trying to act out an angel speaking to him. And then when he's like, okay, and the messenger from Malachi, he tries to get there. He's like, okay, forget it. His signals were totally lost on them. Imagine how desperate he was to tell people the good news about John and ultimately about Jesus. By the time he loosened his lips, he could probably hardly contain himself. Can you feel his frustration? Are you dying for him to start telling people what he had heard, what the good news that was coming? And yet, this is gentle, loving discipline from God to teach Zechariah to trust him. There is a difference between discipline and punishment. And this is really important. In punishing you, God is paying you back for your sin. Discipline is when God gets out a surgical knife and corrects something in you for your good. Would I want somebody to stab me in my chest? Well, I guess it depends on their purpose, right? If they're trying to murder me, no. But if they're doing open heart surgery to save me, my life, then yes. For believers, Jesus does not punish people for their sins. Why? Because Jesus took every ounce of the penalty for your sins. God doesn't punish you for sin because God punished Jesus for your sin. And if God punished Jesus for your sin, he can't punish you because that would be taking two punishments for the same sin and that would not be just. And so now when he works on you, he does so without the slightest hint of retribution. He does so with the scalpel of healing and not the knife of judgment. Jesus got the knife of God's judgment so I could get the scalpel of God's healing. And if you feel like God is paying you back, he's not. He paid Jesus every ounce of retribution so that not a drop remains for you. Zechariah experienced God's discipline to teach him to trust. But even though Zechariah did not have living faith in God, as he should have, God's promises would not stop. They don't depend on you. They depend on him, and he is utterly faithful. So Zechariah learns firsthand that he can't even speak to anybody about how God is at work to fulfill his promises, and yet God comes through. 
The final point I want you to see today deals with Elizabeth's response. And what we're going to see is this. God shows his personal care to those who trust his promises. His personal care. Look at verse 24. It says, And after these, day, th these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. What I want you to see here is how Elizabeth trusts God, and she recognizes that God has personally cared for her. Look again at verse 25. Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. This is deeply personal for Elizabeth. She trusts God and she experiences his, his care for her. God never promises that if you follow him, life will just be easy and smooth. But he calls you to trust him, to trust his word, to trust his promises. And when you trust him, he will show you his personal care for you. It may not be in the exact way and timing that you would have chosen. Because you can't see from God's perspective. You're finite. He's infinite. You're limited in your vision. He sees the end from the beginning. So disappointments and pain will come. The central issue, though, is how will you handle them? Bitterness will lead to anger and frustration sapping the joy out of life. But trust and dependence will cause us to find fulfillment in ways we never would have even thought of. Sometimes a roadblock is not a dead end, but is a fresh turn in the road. And even if construction and detours keep popping up in every season and every corner, we can rely on our faithful father. Elizabeth teaches us that our sense of grief over our disappointments should be taken to God, and our rejoicing should be taken to him as well. There's no pain you're going through, no suffering that you're going through that you would remove from your life if you could see what God sees and you knew all that he knows. Because God uses your pain for your good, and he has a plan for your good and for his glory, so you can trust him. Maybe you're in a season of life where you're feeling barren. There are many ways to be barren. Maybe you're in a season of life that is just not what you were hoping for, not what you were expecting. And the point is not that God is going to give you what you were expecting. In fact, in many ways, Zechariah and Elizabeth never got the enjoyment out of the thing they hoped for. They probably died when John was a boy or a young man. They never got to see him grow up. They never had grandkids. The point is not that the birth of John the Baptist took away their barrenness. But there was another baby who was in the process of being born to someone else who would do that. You see, Luke interweaves the story of John's birth with the story of Jesus' birth. And ultimately, only Jesus is the answer to our soul's barrenness. You see, the reason our hearts are not happy is not because we don't have children or romance or money or success. It's because we're separated from God. And Jesus' primary mission was to restore us to God, to seek and to save the lost. And that's what takes away our barrenness. The Messiah was to be born to Mary, who would take our sin and condemnation by dying in our place on the cross, removing our separation from God, and he would make it so that we knew God again. And God is such a treasure that when you have him, you can deal with all the disappointment of childness, childlessness, or poor health, or singleness, or grief, or loss, or whatever. It's not that he doesn't also give good gifts to his children. It's just that the best gift he gives, the one that takes away our sadness and despair and fills our life with real joy and security, is not those things. The best gift is God himself, who came in the person of Jesus. So though we may be experiencing disappointment, God is at work. He's fulfilling his promises. His promises are both cosmic and personal, and they point to Jesus. And God calls us to have a real living faith in him. 
But even if we have unbelief, that's not going to stop him from fulfilling his purposes. And God shows his personal care to those who trust in his promises. And all those promises are centered in the person of Jesus. He is our hope. You know, in the book that C.S. Lewis considered his best work, Till We Have Faces, he dedicated it to his wife, Joy, and he finished the book with these words. He said, I know now, Lord, why you utter no answer. You yourself You are yourself the answer. Before your face, questions die away. What other answer would suffice? Ultimately, Jesus is the answer to our heart's longings. So let's live by faith in him this week. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we confess that even in our lives this week, there have been times where we have lived as Zachariah did, Lord, without trusting you allowing unbelief to creep into our lives. And we confess that sin and turn away from it, Lord, and ask that you would help us to live in a real living faith, Lord, that we would live recognizing that this life on this earth is temporary, but you have given us an eternal kingdom that is unshakable. Help us to live for that eternal kingdom, Lord. Help us to fix our eyes on you. Help us to trust you at each step along the way and help us to live for your purposes. Thank you for loving us and for being patient with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Nathaniel. Let's all stand as we close out with this last song.
Christ is mine One of the joys of preaching is that often I don't connect with our worship team, and then God orchestrates the last song so that it like totally fits into the sermon. So anyway, thank you guys. Um, if you're a guest with us, we're so happy you're here. There is a table right out there where you can get more information. There's people who'd love to talk to you. There's also a prayer team who would love to pray with you over by our defibrillator and our new water station courtesy of Wisdom Water, right over there. So, um, living water and heart work, all in the same corner, so, all right. So go get prayer if you need prayer, and have a great Sunday. Thank you. <coughs> Let the king